<laughs> Hi, everyone. We're going to go ahead and get started with tonight's webinar. Um, I'd like you to uh, mute your phone or your computer while we are um, while the presentation is going on. And if we have questions, we can stop and unmute and ask them. Um, so I see somebody on the phone. I'm going to mute you um, just so that we can't. Um, we don't hear background noise and that sort of thing. Uh, our slides, I'm going to share my screen with you and you, can, um, and you can access the slides. They're also in our Google Classroom and I'll go over how to get there in a second. So here are our slides. Move this over. And now I'm in presentation mode. Uh, so I'm going to go ahead and get started, and I will pause at various points, and we can check in and make sure that everything is going smoothly on your end. And uh, we can, um, you know, take questions and, and go forward. Tonight we're going to be talking about um, working with multimedia, and by multimedia I mean basically images and video. So I'm going to show you where to find images and video, uh, tools for creating and editing video, and uh, perhaps we'll have a little bit of time to think about how you can use these instructionally. Uh, typically, people use multimedia in presentations, in digital worksheets for students, uh, for creating digital books, that sort of thing. And so sometimes it's helpful to know uh, what are the best tools for creating your own images or for finding stuff that people have already made. And it's also important to know when you're borrowing images uh, about um, copyright and fair use laws. Um, so we'll go over that a little bit today so that you're familiar with that. We want to thank Rio Salado College for sponsoring this webinar series and the Educators Rising program in particular. So thank you, Rio. We're very happy to have this opportunity. This is, we're on number seven out of many webinars that will be going on between now and the end of August. And my name is Lucy Gray, I'm your host. And you can go to this link and see what other webinars are coming up in the future. We're doing about one every week or every other week. They are all recorded and they are all placed in our Google Classroom. Um, if you miss one, you can go into our Google Classroom and watch the archive if you'd like to. I also make the slides available too so that you can um, click on the resources and explore them while I'm talking or after the webinar. So our Google Classroom is uh, set up so that you get some experience with using this tool for distributing content and assignments to your students, potentially. And it's also meant to be kind of a, a one place for finding everything that is going on in this webinar series. It will be uh, available indefinitely, so I'm not gonna be taking it down anytime soon. And you're more than welcome to go into it anytime during this series or after the series to um, peruse the content that we've, we've created. To get to this classroom, um, you're going to go to classroom.google.com and you need to log in with your personal email, Gmail address. This probably will not work with your school Gmail address because your administrator of your Google, uh, your G Suite applications probably hasn't allowed you to collaborate in classrooms outside of your school's domain. So my advice to you is to create a personal Gmail address if you've not done so already, and to use that for this, this particular webinar series. Um, when you're in Google Classroom, you're going to click on a plus sign and then select join class on that web page, and you're going to enter this code um, and you might want to take a picture of this or write it down really quickly so you have it for future reference. You're going to enter that code under the plus sign where it says join a class and you will be 
you will get into a setup that looks like this. So this is our Google Classroom. And uh, if I, if I, uh, I would go back to my front page just to kind of review this for you, with you. Um, you take the code that I gave you, you click on the plus sign in the upper right hand corner at classroom.google.com and you click on join class and you put in the code that, uh, that has been given to you. And you will then have access to uh, this self-paced professional development resource that I have been building as we've been doing these webinars. Uh, the first area is if you have questions or want to post anything um, to share with a group, you're more than welcome to do that. Um, and I see that somebody, Mark Smith, left me a question, so I need to um, I need to get back to him on that. So that's great. So that's what that's there for is to ask questions, and then I'll respond to it when I can. Um, so there's a section for each uh, tech talk that we've had so far, and there the slides are in there and additional resources that will supplement what we're talking about. Uh, you might want to mute your, um, your microphone right now. Hi. I hear someone in the background. And I'm going to mute you. There we go. Okay. Um, it, it's helpful if everybody's muted until um, we do Q&A so that we, don't, we avoid background noise. Uh, so anyway, there are different sections for the different topics that we have covered so far. And it includes the archived video, the slides, and additional resources typically in each category. Right now we're on number eight in this Google Classroom and you'll see that I've created an assignment which is just uh, basically to give you a calendar placeholder for tonight's webinar and the link to the webinar. I've included the slides that I'm going to be using tonight and there's a whole slew of additional resources for you to look through um, either at, during the webinar or after the webinar whenever you are interested in kind of digging into this stuff. So that's kind of for future reference. Um, when this webinar is done tonight, I will be putting the recording into this Google Classroom and you can always go back to it and you're more than welcome to share it with friends or whatever. You can invite your friends and colleagues into this Google Classroom if they want to join this. This is not just for real people, it's for anyone um, who is interested in learning about educational technology and how to use it better in your classroom. So that's the overview. Um, that's a code to get in Google Classroom if you haven't written it down. And um, we're using the Zoom platform for the video conference and I just want to mention that there is a chat area, so if you want to put questions in there, I'll check it every once in a while. Um, uh, as I mentioned before, if you mute, you mute your microphone, then we can't hear your background noise, which is good during the webinar, but when we do Q&A, it would be great for you to uh, unmute so that we can have a conversation about any questions or resources that you recommend. So we'll pause to do that um, a few, you know, periodically during this webinar. Uh, a little bit about me, if you haven't joined us before, I'm Lucy Gray, I'm a former classroom teacher and technology coach, and I work with companies and schools and whoever will have me to help them be more innovative, and uh, I work all over the world um, doing different kinds of things. Uh, last week, I, I, I recorded our webinar because I was traveling, I was in Paris actually to write uh, Paris in New York. I was in Paris to write a mobile learning report for UNESCO and then um, meeting with some people for additional work in New York. And so I was uh, I was supposed to be on a plane last week um, at the time of our webinar, so I pre-recorded it. Uh, and I also will be pre-recording on July 11th when um, I will be on a road trip with my family. But normally these will be live and so on and so forth. Anyway, you can find me on Twitter. My handle is Elementus. Um, theoretically, if you want to post anything to Twitter to share with our group, you can use the hashtag EdRising at Rio. And you're always welcome to contact me through email if you have a specific question um, at any time. Think of me as your personal technology coach uh, going forward. Uh, if you're new to us, we have a Padlet, which is kind of a digital 
board with sticky notes on it where you can uh, read about people who've attended the webinars and add your own background information. Uh, so take a look at that when you have time. The thing on the right hand side is a QR code and you can scan that with a tablet or a phone and with a QR code reader um, and it will take you to, to the Padlet where you can um, double click on it and add a sticky note of your own to it. I really love Padlet. I think it's a really uh, a great tool for using uh, in a variety of creative ways in your classroom. And it's, I think they're going to a paid model. So I think you can only do a certain amount of them for free. Um, I also, we've had an ongoing icebreaker where we've asked people to share what their favorite personal use of technology is. This is another Padlet. And I would uh, appreciate if you if you shared your thoughts on that too. So last week, um, I'm going to break out of these slides for a second. Last week, we I recorded a session on uh, on creating effective presentations. Did anybody happen to watch the recording? Out of curiosity. All right, Ruby. Ruby gets an A. <laughs> um, and Ruby, I'm going to unmute you for a second. Uh, uh, if I can click on your button, maybe you have to unmute yourself. Oh, no, I can do it. So, no, maybe you, yeah, I can't unmute you. Um, do you have any questions or did anything stand out to you uh, from last night's, or from last week's webinar? And I can't unmute anybody. <laughs> Let's see. Let me pull out the chat. Here's a chat. Okay. All right. Okay. So you can take a look at it, guys, when you have a chance. Um, yeah, Ruby. Good. Good observation. There are a lot of um, uh, there are a lot of similarities to PowerPoint. So I talked about a few tools that you can use. Like there's one called Prezi, which is not linear, it, I didn't go into it in great detail, I just kind of listed it. Um, but Prezi is a, 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 sl a slideware type of tool that lets you, um, uh, I, should, I should have my videos showing, sorry. I haven't, there ha here I am. Um, so yeah, Prezi will, will let you do um, kind of a, it's all over the place. It's not linear with slides in a row, it's kind of like a web. Um, and some teachers like it, some people may make them dizzy, kind of, or they just don't like it. Uh, but I spent most of my time going over Google Slides, which is what I'm using for the slides for this presentation. And because the, 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 what I'm emphasizing in the, few, the, the first part of these webinars is the use of Google tools and getting used to that sort of thing. So it is like PowerPoint, but it's on the web, it's in the cloud. And you don't have to worry about saving it from computer to computer because it auto saves. It's on the web, so if you log into um, if you log into one computer, you'll be able to access your slides on another computer. You don't have to stress out about using a thumb drive or emailing it to yourself or whatever you know you want to do. Um, and the add-ons, yeah, the add-ons were really interesting too, Ruby. So um, in Google Slides, there are these extra tools. Um, you may be able to see them here. Um, every slides, drive, docs, forms, all have like a little store added onto them. And these, and it's called, these are called add-ons. They have third-party tools that add functionality uh, to it. And so the one that Ruby's talking about is um, the Magic Rainbow unicorn slide and I can't remember what this does actually now that I think about it um, but you can select text and um, you can uh, turn them into a rainbow colors <laughs> with this add-on it's not it's not particularly useful but it was kind of fun to play around with so there are lots of add-ons that do interesting things and they're under the add-ons menu you click on get add-ons and you can um, look through and see which ones might be useful to you. 
I think this, this flat one is kind of cool for music teachers. And uh, Pear Deck is another one that's been really popular for formative assessment. Um, so there are, there are a lot in here that you may uh, find interesting if you're trying to take your, your presentations, um, you know, kick them up a notch. So uh, when you have time, take a look at last week's um, uh, webinar, and you can learn more about uh, about uh, you know kicking up uh, your your presentations uh, to another level. That's kind of um, what the goal was. So this week we're going to be focusing on um, on on images and videos, essentially, and talking about copyright and fair use a little bit, uh, and. You can find the slides that I'm showing you right now at bit.ly slash tech talks seven in slides. Uh, so you're more than welcome to join in. Uh, one of the things that you may have noticed with docs and, and sheets and slides is that when somebody shares it publicly, like I, I go to the share button up here um, and I give you, you know, the link here. I can, if I post that link somewhere, like on a website or in Google Classroom, you know, anyone can get in and see these slides. They can't mess with them, they can't edit them unless I change the levels of permissions here. But everybody can see them and I, it's easy for people to jump in. If you just wanna share with one or two people, you can put their email or address in here and share it with them directly. But I tend to make things public and then just give people the link because it's easier to get in there. And when people come in to, to my slide deck and are looking at it, they show up in the upper right-hand corner. And this is something I did not talk about very much in the last couple of webinars. And if it's a generic link that I haven't sent to specific people, people will show up as some sort of anonymous animal. So we have anonymous grizzly and anonymous quagga, whatever that is, it looks like a zebra, um, in here right now. But that's one of you that has the link. Uh, if I gave you, if I email it to you and it was linked to your Google ID, your name and your, your icon from your Google account would show up here and I would see that you were in here. And so um, you, can, you, can, you can have conversations and things like that and track conversations, um, you know, by these identifiers within a document. Uh, if we were working in a, if I gave you editing privileges and we were working in a Google document, I could actually tell where people were writing in the document too. It's kind of cool. So if you're wondering what those icons are, that means that we've got two people in the document besides me. Uh, Christina is the grizzly and Michelle is the quagga. <laughs> that's a new animal for me, totally. Uh, that's funny, isn't it? Yeah, and every time I, I do this, there's always a whole new slew of animals. Um, so you never know what you're gonna turn up to be. Um, anyway, sharing, you know, what makes this different and more powerful than, uh, than um, you know, Microsoft PowerPoint is that you can share and collaborate together. And so one of the ways I saw it being used, uh, Google Slides being used in a classroom once, was as a study guide. A teacher, you know, I think the best assignments are when they're scaffolded and really specific. And this teacher said, um, I want you to research like a Civil War hero or something, a Civil War event uh, in pairs. I want you to find five facts and two images and put it on one slide. So like 20 kids were working on one slide deck and each had a slide to complete. And by the end of the period, they all had, they had this collaborative slide deck that they could use as a study guide. So I think the best uses of this I, I, I've seen are when teachers use it creatively to have the kids construct the knowledge and share the knowledge together. Oh, and we have a new animal, by the way, so somebody else got in there, and that is, uh, I don't know what kind of animal that is, an anonymous hedgehog. So welcome, anonymous hedgehog. <laughs> All right, so let's get into what we're trying to cover tonight. Um, if you've been here before, you know that we've talked about the ISTE standards, the International Society for uh, Technology and Education Standards. And um, they are for students and they are standards for, for teachers. And they have gotten to be, um, uh, I, what I like about them is that they're very, they're very um, 
Oh, so Michelle has a question. Are you able to give permission to certain pages of the slides and not to the others? No, you can't get down to that micro level. That's a really good question, Michelle. But you know what? I don't find that kids mess around with each other's stuff. And um, they're pretty respectful of it. And you can always tell who's done something to somebody's stuff because there's um, version history. So you can always nail whoever it was that, that deleted something. Or you can, if somebody did by accident, you can restore it to a previous version. So this is another thing that makes it very different than using you know, Word to store it on your computer. I have not used um, Microsoft 365 at all. So I don't know how that would, I know it's a web-based version of Word and all that, but um, I don't know if it works the same way or not. Um, anyway, so, so the standards are really kind of our guidelines for what good instruction looks like and for modernizing teaching and learning. It's not just all about the tech. It's about learning together, collaborating, uh, sharing, digital citizenship. Um, and, and if you haven't seen those, please take a look at them. I think um, our work tonight is really focusing on the learner and the leader standards for educators, um, and in particular, ladies, the indicators under them um, pursue professional interests by creating and actively participating in a in local and global learning networks. We're learning together here, so that's your network. And um, modeling for colleagues the identification, exploration, and evaluation, curation, and adoption of new digital resources for learning. So, um, yeah, yeah, there we go. Um, so that's that's what we're trying to work on tonight in terms of um, our work. So I'd like to have a discussion first to kind of see what your background knowledge is on multimedia. Um, where, if you want to type it in, if you want to unmute and share, either way is fine. Where do you find images to use in documents and presentations or movies you know right now personally or professionally do you ever how do you get images there's no right or wrong answer okay google images christina ruby uses google too okay your computer's library so sometimes your computer will have stuff on it in in like powerpoint Obviously, like if you're using that, that probably has images already kind of built in. Michelle, ooh, Michelle's an advanced student here. She searches for copyright free images. Ooh, okay. And clip art, you find clip art too. Uh huh, that counts as images, absolutely. Okay. So, um, do you guys know how to grab it from the internet? Do you know how to save it to your computer if you want to? Oh, good. And Christina cites and gives credit. All right. Christina also gets an A. You guys are gifted. Okay, so Michelle's right. You right click and save if you have a two button mouse or on a PC or something. Um, if I'm on, let's see, um, I'll give you an example of what I do. So, um, so image, uh, Google Images. Google Images is like the best thing since sliced bread. I'll do a couple things here to demo for you. Um, so images.google.com is where you go. You can search by images, by the way. You can drag and drop another image here and it will find similar images. You can also use search by voice if you don't, if you don't feel like typing it in. So um, you allow your microphone to work. So it's gonna look for funny work, which is not what I want to do. <laughs> but um, you can search and, and find things here. Um, I think this is the one that I want here. This is probably, um, I love these, these kinds of quotes. The best part of my job is the chair swivels. So, um, you can search that way or you can just type in here, uh, whatever your search term is. So let's say I want to find, um, hmm, I'm feeling very summery. So let's say I'm looking for a beach ball picture for some reason. And it's going to show me pictures like this. And what I love about Google Images is that it lets me, it will let me sort by color. So if I just want a black and white picture, I can do that. And it gives me some line art pictures. Maybe I want to use something that's like, a, you know, for a document that has line art. Um, or I can search for coloring pages or, you know, I can, there are a lot of different ways that you can search. Um, and 
also under images, there is um, settings. You can, you can change your settings here and tools. So what I love about tools is I can search by color. So let's say I want a pink beach ball. I can just look for pinch, pink beach balls. And then it gets even better. Let's say I want one that is copyright friendly. And yeah, copy and pasting uh, works too, Ruby. Um, so you can also search by, you know, how recent and the sizes and when they were posted, you know, um, all different kinds of images. But the thing that I wanted to show you that I think is really powerful is under usage rights. And so this, what it means, um, so when a picture is created by someone, they own the rights to it. You can't just grab it and use it wherever. And you would not believe how many people I run into who think that just because it's on the internet means you can use it. And, um, and best practice is to cite where you find your images. So you do want sometimes to save the link to where the image came from. Um, but here, this kind of makes it a little bit easier for you. So under usage rights, you can say, I want images that will let me reuse it and modify the image. I want to use this for, you know, pictures that are labeled for non-commercial reuse with modification, which means you can use it as long as you're not making money off of it. And um, you can, uh, and I can also modify it and change it up a little bit if I want to. These are types of Creative Commons licenses. And I'm gonna talk a little bit about that in a second. So if you wanna make sure that they have a license to reuse and remix, use this feature. So let's say I wanna use labeled for reuse. And these ones I can all, these ones I'm, it's okay for me to use, all right? So um, I go to, you know, this is from Oriental Trading Company, I guess they've licensed their pictures. Um, uh, I can go to any of these images. Uh, let me find a good one. Um, I'll take the donut, the donut one. Um, it's not a beach ball, but hey. Um, and it, it's from a website called Pexels, which is something actually I'm going to talk about. And you can visit the site. You can save it. And don't ask me where it goes when you save it. I think it goes into your bookmarks. And I can also share it with other people over social media, or here's the link to it. So if I want to make sure that I'm saving links to these images in order to give them the proper attribution, I could, okay? Um, but the way that I, I download it is um, on my Mac, I can control click, and this contextual menu pops up and lets me save the image or copy the image, um, and then I save it to my computer and then I can repurpose it. Um, so that is one thing that you should know, but Google Images is awesome. So right-clicking or, um, right-clicking or control-clicking often do the same thing. Sometimes you can also um, drag and drop pictures to, to your desktop, and that saves you a little bit of time. The other thing that's kind of cool in um, Google that I mentioned earlier is that you can search by images. So if I take this flamingo picture, let's see if it will work. Um, I want to drag and drop it, so let me do it. Okay, so this picture, let's say I want to take this, and it's kind of giving me a hard time here. Um, let me find another picture. I can, I can drop an image up here, and it's going to find pictures that will match it. So I came up with these things, which are not very useful. But um, you can search by images, which is another really cool feature. So um, I think Google Images is really powerful, and it's it's a little bit beyond just using plain old Google. Um, and you know, I just think that I think it saves you a lot of time. So right, and I've already talked about right clicking and that sort of thing. Okay, now I have a couple more questions for you. Um, do you guys know how to take a screenshot? Uh, lots of times when I'm making tutorials, um, oh, the top row, Michelle was sponsored. Maybe that's why I couldn't grab it. Um, um, so, so do you guys know how to take a screenshot? So Christina does, 
Do the rest of you guys know how to do a screenshot? Really helpful to be able to do it on your computer, on your phone, in different places. So you use Screen Clip or ShareX. Are those um, are those Chrome app, Chrome apps or Chrome extensions, Michelle, or are they um, software that you install on your computer? You have on your okay. You haven't tried on your computer, Ruby. Okay. So um, ShareX is a Google extension. Okay, that's good to know because we talked about those in another one. Uh, Stephanie is with Windows. Okay, I'm not a Microsoft Windows person, so you guys are gonna be my Windows people for me. Uh, Shirley, do you have a question? Uh, yes, how do you do a screenshot? Yeah, I just wanted to ask and then I was gonna go into it. So there are a couple, of diff there are a couple different ways to do it. Um, and it depends on, Shirley, what kind of computer do you have? Chrome. You have Chrome as your brow. You have a Chrome, you have a Chromebook. Chromebook, right? Okay, so um, so I have these things called extensions installed on mine. So an example of, of a of a free Chrome extension that would let you take a screenshot, and it's really easy. Is awesome is awesome screenshot. And if you look on my computer up in the right hand corner, it's installed there called Awesome Screenshot. It also does screen recordings. So I can click on this and capture part of my page or the whole page. Um, I'm gonna take a, I'm gonna, I'm gonna do a screen, I'm gonna do a screenshot of the whole page and it captures it. And then I can actually annotate it and mark it up and do things with it. And when I'm done with it, I can save it um, to my computer or save it to the web on Awesome Screenshots website. So I like this, and I actually think I might have paid for some of the advanced features of this, but you don't need to. Like, there's a lot of features in here that you don't need to pay for. Um, so I like using Awesome Screenshot as a as a Chrome extension, and you get that um, the Chrome Web Store is where you get extensions. Um, Chrome.google.webstore. I'll put it in the chat if you don't know this already. And uh, there are going to be a lot of other screenshot type tools in here. Like I can see one right here on the on the front page called Full Page Screen Capture by MrColes.com. I know nothing about it. Or here's another one that does it. Um, you can actually search for screenshot in the web store and it's gonna show you a ver various tools that will let you do it. But the one that I really think is great is Awesome Screenshot. So I'm gonna search for Awesome Screenshot and then you click on the blue button, mine's already installed, and it will pop up to the right of your search box here and you may need to adjust your search box if it's not showing up or look where these three dots are to see you know, where that icon is. Does that make sense, Shirley? I know I just kind of went through that kind of fast. Yes, but, okay. okay, so that's just, that's just one method for doing it. On my Mac, I also have a tool called uh, Grab. And Grab lets me capture a selection, a window, or a time screen. So if I just want to, like, do a quick screenshot, you know, of one part of a website, I can do that and then save it to my desktop. And then I can repurpose it in a presentation or whatever I'm making. Um, so shift command four, command shift four, is that from Mac or PC, Christina? Shift command four. from math and what are the so sometimes screen um, key combinations will allow you to do a screenshot on a PC is there a way are there screen are there keys uh, keystrokes that you can hit that will also let you do that keyboard shortcuts for uh, screenshots on 
PC. There's a function key. So um, maybe your print screen button on your PC will let you do that. Control print screen, okay. So whenever I don't know the answer to something, I Google it and boom, it usually comes up there. There's usually some sort of tool how to do that. Um, and I think it's really useful because um, very often, like let's say I want to go to a tech person and show them what's wrong with the screen. If I can send them a screenshot, it helps. But also you can make your own images for your students. Like if you're doing a tutorial for them, um, it helps to have a screenshot with them. Now, it also helps to have some sort of tool that will allow you to annotate a screenshot. So I'm going to open up, this is on a Mac. Um, I'm going to control click and open um, the screenshot that I made with, with a tool called Preview that's built into my Mac. <clears throat> and there are other tools that will do this. Um, and they have some tools that are, let's see, that let you do, there's a, there's a toolbar, show tab bar, show sidebar, show markup toolbar, maybe that's what I'm looking for, yeah. So on my Mac, with the tools here, I can highlight and draw on the image and annotate it however I want to. I can even um, use the text tool and I think I'm not doing it properly, but there's, there's all these different tools that you can do to edit the image. Um, let's see if it's gonna work. I don't know why it's not letting me write in there. But anyway, I can, I can, draw, I can draw circles on it. Uh, oh, there, it did do the text, sorry. Uh, it just, I didn't see where it was going. So here's some text boxes that I made. So very often you can add annotations to your images with a variety with two, of tools. On a Mac, Preview does that. And um, <clears throat> I also have an iPhone too, and I often take screenshots with my iPhone. Um, I could plug it in and show it to you how I do it. I think I, I hold down the home button and the side button and it um, and I, I can click and it will give me um, a screenshot on my phone and on iPhones and I'm sure that's the same thing on um, on other kinds of phones there's a tool called markup that will let me annotate just like I annotated in preview I can also annotate on my iPhone with similar tools and it's called markup and um, and I can I can do that to an image that I take from my phone as well so um, if you have an iPhone, you might want to, you know, Google that and find out how you can use markup. Um, and then I, th we could do a whole session on iPhones. It's awesome. I don't have an Android phone, so I don't know exactly how it would work, but I'm sure there's something, you know, similar to that. Um, but I think it's really helpful if you, uh, you know, sometimes I might take a picture and I want to send it to my husband and I want to, point out something in the picture to him. I can draw a circle around, you know, part of the picture and then send it to him via a text. You know, there's, it's kind of a, it's, it's very handy to have, um, to know how to do that. So if I were you, I would explore that a little bit further beyond the confounds of this presentation. Um, so copyright. Um, how, are you guys familiar with copyright and how that works and what fair use is? Or is that a new term for you? Could use more information? Okay, so fair use. So copyright means that whoever creates something owns it and you can't just go using it willy nilly. Okay, so Ruby's had a class on this, excellent. Okay, so this is, you know, when you Google something like fair use, by the way, it pops up in this card um, you know, like a, a, you know, it gives you the definition, which is really handy in Google. So you have to ask people or pay them to use their image. You can't just go grab, you know, Barbara Streisand's latest hit or whatever, uh, and use it in a movie. You have, you can't, you have to give people attribution, and often you have to pay them for their image or whatever. So fair use is a set of laws that will help. Um, 
help educators, this is not a really good document for it, help educators use some things with a little bit more flexibility. So let's see if this will help. Um, so there are certain things that you can do with fair use. I'll give you the link to this. But I believe that you can make copies for your classroom like of a short story. But you have to keep reusing those copies and you can do a certain amount of them and, and it will still be legal. Um, I know that you can use up to a certain amount of images as long as you give attribution and you're not republishing the work. Um, I know that you can use like 10% or a certain amount of time of a song in a piece of multimedia without violating copyright law. So, you know, the whole focus of this presentation is not going to be on, on, on copyright law, but my suggestion to you is that you're, you're conversant about it. And I want to say, there's a guy that works for Discovery Education, um, Paul Davidson. And he's done a lot of presentations on copyright. Let's see if he has a really good resource out there on there. Um, he has a chart, classroom copyright chart. Ah, this is perfect. This is exactly what we need. I'll put the link into the chat. Um, so this will give you um, what the what the kind of, what the medium is, what you can do with it, and what the law is, um, and then some more detail about what you can and cannot do. So there's, I think there's actually a fair amount of leeway, to, you know, to use portions of things in your in your um, in your classroom. And I, I also think it's really important to teach students about this too as they're putting together presentations and things like that. So uh, just be aware of it. Related to this is uh, Creative Commons. And um, are you guys familiar with Creative Commons? Is this something that's new to you or have you heard about it before? New to you? Okay, new. Okay, excellent. That's good to know. Okay, all right, I'm teaching you something that you don't already know. Okay, so uh, Creative Commons is an organization that started at Stanford by a law professor. And um, you know, we're living in the age of people taking people's uh, content and remixing it and reusing it and making their own and being creative with all this amazing digital content that has flooded our lives, right? And so Creative Commons is a way of, you can take your pictures and assign a Creative Commons license to that so that other people might use it um, in creative ways but still give you attribution. And so it's a way to get around standard, inflexible copyright laws and, and to foster a collaborative and sharing culture around digital content. So there's videos in the slides. I'm not going to show you the videos because I we have too much stuff to get to. But there are videos that explain it a little bit better. Um, there are six types of licenses. And they are, um, they, they, there's usually a legal part, there's some sort of human part, and there's a machine part of it, I guess. But anyway, so the first type of license is attribution. And so if you had a website with pictures on it, you could put this label on it. And that means this has a Creative Commons license and you must give me attribution if you use my in my images. And this is the most flexible out of all of them, okay? So if you're really trying to get your stuff out there and you don't care what people do with it, they just give you credit, you would put this license on your stuff. Um, and so there, you know, like this one, attribution no derives means you have to, if you use one of my images, you have to give me credit and you can't change it. You can't make a copy of it and make another, you know, derivative, you know, another version of it that's different. Um, and then this one is like you can't use it for commercial uses and things like that. So there's a lot of flexibility that's um, built into this. Uh, Creative Commons is a nonprofit. 
It's been around for a while. It's, it's really um, a forward-thinking organization. Um, in Google Images, they're basing their stuff on Creative Commons. I believe YouTube also uses, you can search for YouTube for Creative Commons stuff to reuse in your presentations and things. Um, Flickr, which is a photo sharing site that I used to use all the time, has a whole Creative Commons section on it. And, um, and, and when I upload my pictures to, to Flickr, which I really don't use anymore, um, I, I give it a license so that people can reuse it and that sort of thing. So here you can search Flickr just for photos according to those licenses, which is awesome. Um, good question, Ruby. I, I know that they have outposts of this around the world, so I think they're trying to standardize it. But in our case, it's, it's definitely applicable to the US. If you go back to here, I saw something about other countries at the bottom. So this page is also available in other languages. That's not it. But I'm, I'm pretty sure this is an international movement. So um, at the top of this page here, it says Global Affiliate Network. So if you wanted to see what other countries were doing, you might want to check out their network and see how this, how this actually operates in other places. And it looks like they have mailing lists for other co part, con continents. So I, I honestly don't know legally how it works, but it sounds like they're, they're trying to make this a global movement. Um, so in Flickr, um, if I want to find pictures I can use, you know, with, that, with the, the, the most broad license, I can go here and, um, and explore images that have that, that have that attribute license. So if I wanted to use, you know, this picture, See, I mean, these are not very exciting pictures, particularly. I could, oh, I could search here. So I could search for, you know, a picture of a flower or something in here. Um, oh, so this is a little bit different. So here are pictures of flowers, and it says attribution here. And I would say, you know, let's say I want to use a commercial use allowed. That's the kind of license I'm going to pick. I could take one of these great photos. Sometimes they're really fabulous pictures in Clicker and I could use this somehow. I still should give attribution to it, okay? So um, the great thing is you don't have to go to five million sites either. Um, for this, there is something called a Creative Commons um, search. So back on the Creative Commons website, this is a giant search engine that will search Flickr, it will search Google, it will search Wikimedia, Pixabay, SoundCloud, other places. So it's not just um, pictures, it's also video, it also applies to audio. And you can search here, and it's going to find images for you in uh, Creative Commons search. Um, hopefully. Come on, go, search. Try the new CC search beta. Okay, maybe this is a better one. All right, this looks better. So I can type in flower here and go. And it's going to give me 1,700 different flowers that I could choose from and to use in, in whatever I'm doing. So um, I think this is like a really good resource. And, uh, oh, they have an advanced search. So, you know, you can say, you can kind of uh, customize, you know, um, what you're looking for. Pretty nifty, huh? Um, so let's talk. Let's see if I have other questions for you. Um, okay, last question I have um, is editing. If you take a picture of your own or you download a picture that you're allowed to modify, do you know how to edit your photo or do something fun with it or change it up a bit? And if so, what kinds of tools do you use? Okay, so Ruby knows how to crop them. That's good. That's a start through an editor. Christina, what editor do you use? Do you use something that's built into your computer? So I use, um, I use, I, oh, it's not iPhoto anymore. It's, it's Apple Photos. 
for I use Google Photos. And I can do some basic editing built in. So, you, you, so Christina, ooh, Photoshop, Photoshop, Adobe Photoshop, which is probably the most sophisticated tool out there, or one of them. And you don't, it, it, you, it, I think it's, you learn how to use it a little bit, it's really valuable. Um, and Adobe's Photoshop used to be also very expensive, but now they, um, I have the tools. Um, let's see where they are. Uh, I buy the suite and I pay 30 bucks a month for it. Um, there it is. Uh, and it's worth it. I don't know if I'm logged in, so I don't know if it will work. But it's, it, this is like professional grade um, software. It, you used to have to install it. Now it's completely on, on the web. And it's not hard to do. I, you know, I recommend, you know, if you have opportunity to take a course in using this, I think this is a really great skill set. And once you learn to work in the, this environment, you'll see other programs that are similarly built. Like for instance, with this tool, you can work in layers so that you can create something pretty sophisticated. Um, and that layered approach you'll see in other kinds of editing software. But, yeah, so don't let this intimidate you, okay? That's, that's one way to edit photos. Um, Another one is um, if you use Google Photos, which I love, and we could do a whole session just on photos. Um, so first of all, with Google Photos, what you should know is I, I back up all my photos in multiple ways because I don't ever want to lose them. And, um, and I can do it automatically. Yes, Ruby, I agree. You can spend hours on this stuff. It can be in Christina, you can spend hours on this and yes, I think the tool depends on the amount of detail you want to do and how, how much you want to do. So I take pictures on my phone all the time and um, I have Google Photos set up to sync with Google Photos online. So I don't have to upload them manually to Google Photos, they just show up. And um, what's fun about these is, I take a lot of pictures of my cat, there I am with my cat. Um, it will, they have this thing called Google Assist or um, Photos Assistant, and Assistant, and it will it will bring up pictures from different you know five years ago or whatever, and remind you about them, which is kind of fun. But sometimes they will also change. They'll like they'll enhance some pictures. It's hilarious. Like they'll add a smile to it, or they'll I don't know. There's kind of funny little things that they'll do automatically to pictures to enhance them. Um, Sometimes they turn things into a movie, uh, and you can create movies here too um, on your own. Like, like oh, here's here's an example of one that they did. So they they took all the pictures of like oh I, well maybe I didn't maybe they didn't make this lovely. Um, but what so you can pick like a template here, and like this one is smiles of 2017. And what this will do is they'll they'll go through all your pictures from 2017 and find a bunch of smiley pictures and it will make a movie for you. And you can edit it a little bit, um, but it's kind of cool. So it's, it will let me know when it's ready. Or I can make a Father's Day movie. Perfect, I'm gonna do that right now. So it will let, oh, and I can pick the, the father. There's my husband, and there's my dad. And then, oh, this is kind of fun. And then uh, kids, those are the kids. I don't think we have any other kids that I know of. And press done, and it's going to make a movie for me and let me know when it's ready. So um, that's kind of a fun thing if you're not like super sophisticated with editing stuff and you don't have time or whatever, it will let you do some fun things. Um, you can make collages on your own, but sometimes they do auto stuff. It's really wild. Uh, I organize my stuff into albums periodically, um, which is helpful. Um, and then these photos are actually in my Google Drive by the way. Uh, yeah, I need my cat to be added. You're right. You're absolutely right. Uh, my cat's hilarious. His name is Smokey. So speaking of the cat, this is what's a great thing about Google Photos. And I didn't think about putting this into the presentation for tonight, but I think it's important to pay attention or to spend a little bit of time on this. So I can search for the word cat and it's going to find just about every single cat picture in my library. Um, yes, Michelle, I do pay for extra storage. I pay the highest level, which is like 10 bucks a month, which I think is cheap. Uh, and I haven't run out of anything yet. And I, 
you know, I, maybe I don't need to pay for it, but I don't want to get into a situation where I am, um, where I am, you know, running out of space. So I just pay for it. And I know that, uh, and I also, I can also back up to Google photos from my Macs around my house too. So I have like multiple ways. Wow, my, my smile movie is already ready. I just got a notification. Um, yeah, so it searches through keywords. Yeah, Christina, it, this is a fairly new feature. So here are all my cat pictures. Isn't that awesome? And the cat, like the cat wants to be everywhere. He sits on, on you know, my shoes. It's, you know, he crawls, curls up on my son's jacket on the floor. Um, so I can then, you know, take pictures of the cat. Here he is on the, on the cleaning. <laughs> um, we joke that I have more pictures um, of my cat than I do of my kids. Um, and I, so anyway, when you get a picture like this, you can also do some very, very basic editing to it right online. So here's a picture of my cat. Um, and let me show you where I was. So here's a picture of my cat. I click on um, this tool, these sliders, and it says edit. And I can automatically do something or give it a filter like this. And you don't have to be a, a Photoshop genius. Um, yeah, surely question. Shirley? Tubs. I'm sorry. Yeah, go ahead, Shirley. I didn't hear you. I said I love Chicago Cubs. Go oh, you Cubs. Do? Are you a Cubs fan? Oh, that's awesome. And they play they play down in, in Phoenix, right? During the in uh, spring training, right? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> We've been down there. I got I actually got engaged down in Arizona and I don't know if we were going to a Cubs game or going to a Giants game when we were down. This is like cool. twenty five years ago. But yeah, um, my husband's a big baseball freak and his dad worked for the Giants, and so they had a condo in, in Scottsdale, and um, I got engaged there many years ago. Um, we no longer have that, um, but anyway. Um, so here's, uh, so this, so just, so you can do some basic editing in Google Photos. That is an option for, you know, somebody who wants to do something that's web-based, uh, that's fairly easy, that's not super technical. Um, yeah, I do a lot of editing on my phone and there are a lot of great apps out there. Uh, Snapseed is one. Um, Polar is another one. Uh, some of them are web-based and they also have apps for your phone too for editing. I tend to use, um, on my phone, I tend to use the built-in features that are, you know, with an image. So, you know, here's a picture on my phone. And I click on it and it says edit and I just use the the features that are that are in there. So we can spend like a whole session on that. Um, did I start late, Michelle? I could have started late. Sorry. And we're getting close to the end, aren't we? But I'm gonna keep going. If you have to leave, leave. I'm gonna keep going. Um, so I'm, ten, it's right now it's, it's almost 10 o'clock my time. So it's almost eight o'clock your time. And it was right. Okay. So I thought we were at seven o'clock your time. All right. Which is later for me. I'm going to keep going. If you have to go keep going, but there's some, there's some other things I, I, I want to show you to make sure that you know how to do that. So, so I want to talk a little bit more about, um, some of the tools that you can use to do the things that we just talked about and also about the video piece. In the, slot, in the presentation, there is a video that you can watch on your own about Creative Commons if you want to review that. Um, these are the licenses that I mentioned earlier. Now, there are lots of places where you can get copyright filing images besides Creative Commons search. Um, so one of the ones I like for teaching in particular are, are there two of them, Photos for Class and Pics for Learning. These are all free, copyright-friendly places that you can get images. So Pix for Learning also makes some cool software for editing things, but they've, they're specifically focused on stuff that would be appropriate for kids. So this is a good site to send your students to. 
um, when you're looking for pictures that might go with a unit that you're teaching. Um, yeah, I really am getting into this. Sorry, Christina. <laughs> um, so anyway, so here, here are lots of pictures that people that, you know, adults have taken that kids can use. Um, and again, you can control click or you can download the image using the button that they provide there. And this is all copyright friendly. Um, this company also does some really cool software and I would recommend looking at it too. Um, Pixabay is pretty popular. Wikimedia does not just images, but also videos. This is kind of like Wikipedia, but of, in, you know, images. So look at all these different kinds of wiki things they have here. Um, so you, you may find some stuff that's pretty interesting there, but you know, I don't know how user friendly this it would be for kids necessarily. My suggestion if you're working on a multimedia project with kids is that you give them a set of photos yourself. You throw them into an album or something and they take that and use it in some capacity because kids will take forever to go through stuff and it's overwhelming for them to find stuff on their own unless they're older. So if you really want a project to go well, give them a folder of 20 pictures and then they just have to work with those to make a movie or to make a, you know, a slideshow or something like that. Um, then the other way you can make um, images, we've talked a little bit about, about this, is you know, through apps um, on, your, on whatever device you use, on your phone, on your tablet, on your webcam. On a Mac, there is something called Photo Booth which I keep forgetting exists. We also have an iPad app for this. And I don't know if you can see this, but um, my students used to love Photo Booth. They would go bananas over this. There are a couple different modes. It, it, it counts down and you can take a picture. And I, I have it in a, I'm doing a, this one will take four pictures at once. Um, but then they also have ones that will, uh, just take a picture, a regular picture. And I look so dorky with these ear pods in, but that's okay. Um, and they also have the ability to do a really short video. Hi, this is a short video that I'm recording in Photo Booth. This is really easy for kids to use and for adults. So if you're just trying to create something really quickly yourself, you can take this and make these images and then you can drag them to your desktop or drag them into your iMovie or whatever you're using in there. So um, the one thing that I, I also really love about Photo Booth is that they have effects. And uh, if you go back here and click on effects, you know, I can put like, um, I can make my eyes bug out. Ooh, that's attractive. Or, you know, um, Dizzy I think makes like birds appear over my head. Uh, so something like that. And I can take a picture of these birds around my head. Ooh, it's Snow White. Um, so these effects are hilarious. And what's cool about them, and these are more filtered kind of effects, but then um, you can also do green screening. Do you, yeah, you could use it for formative assessment. You could have the kids, uh, you could get creative with this somehow. It also used to do something like if you held up a book, you know, you could change the camera so that it would there's a way to do it. You could auto flip the text in here. Um, yeah, you can have the kids record a reflection on something and then send it to you. I would do things, I taught, you know, I had a computer lab when I, the last place I taught, and for an open house, I had my kids record a message for their parents. The parents had to find it at the computer um, the kid sat at and then leave a message or a picture for their kid. And one of my kids' father worked for the White Sox, and he had just won the World Series. So he took a picture of his Super Bowl ring, <laughs> and, or, or his uh, World Series ring for his kid and left it there. It was kind of funny. Um, but anyway, what this is, so on this page, this I don't know if you know what green screen is, but you have this green colored background that lets you superimpose other backgrounds on it. And you can buy kits that have a screen like this, or you can paint a wall, or, you know, it, it, it works better if you have a green background. Um, so it's not gonna work terribly well here, but this comes with backgrounds, this particular set of things. So I click on Eiffel Tower, and it says step out of the frame. So I'm gonna step out of the frame. And then the picture of the Eiffel Tower pops up, and then I can sit up and take a picture of myself. At with, it looks like the Eiffel Tower's in the background. 
Now, it doesn't look great because I'm not using a green screen in the background. If I used a green screen in the background, you wouldn't see all the pixelation around my face and all that sort of thing. Yeah, yep, yep. Every YouTube, people on YouTube, YouTube creators are really good and really professional with all this stuff. But if you have a Mac, you may not realize that you have Photo Booth in here. It also is a, um, an iPad app, and, and I, I just don't think people use it that much. And I think it's really kid friendly and easy if you happen to have that. If you're on a Chromebook, um, you can do similar things, and there are other tools that will let you do that, and we'll, we'll talk about that in a little bit. The other thing I wanted to show you was the Noun Project, and this is what I use with, um, it, it's also a Google add-on, and that's what I use in the slides for these presentations. And some of them are free, some of them are not. I pay for a subscription so that I have access to other ones. But you can search for, you know, uh, you know, any kind of icon, and then use it in a presentation. So if you're looking for this kind of clip arty kind of look, um, this is a really good source of, of, of icons. Um, so these are just some other things here. Oh, this is also lots of fun too. Um, Big Huge Labs has these kind of generators uh, so that you can easily do different types of things. And the one that I played around with today was, uh, I played around with magazine cover. So you can import pictures from your computer, from Facebook, from Google, and create your own custom magazine cover or something silly. So I could see this kind of like, uh, you know, maybe kids are, are making a cover for a project or something like that, and they wanted to make their own magazine cover, they could do that. So Big Huge Labs has these kind of generators that will let you do fun things. Uh, with images um, or your students, theoretically. Um, and the other ones are good here too. So, oh, 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 I can't not talk about Canva. But do you guys know about Canva? I use this the most. Canva is free. If you use, oh, I can't believe you guys don't know about this. This is, this is like worth its weight in gold. Um, if you do use some images in here, it's like a dollar. Like I can handle a dollar, you know, if, if it's really worthwhile. And it has templates and there's also, um, there's uh, Canva for education and education. If you search for Canva for education, it's also gonna show you templates that are just for, for teachers. So you can click on start designing and uh, I guess I searched the templates up here. So I could type in certificate. And it's gonna show me what templates are available. So if you're looking to make a certificate for your students, you can take one um, and put it in here and you customize it for your students but you can also like change the aspects of it. You could make it a different color. You could, um, you know, add, you know, a photo or an image to it. You could do whatever you want to it. Uh, you could change the fonts. Um, and I, I use this all the time. And I actually have like a pro version of this so that I can do some fancier things. But you really don't need to have that. Um, you can add your own photos. Yeah, absolutely. So I've uploaded. You know, here's a picture of Kyle, a guy that I do some work with. I could put his, his picture in here. And I can actually crop and filter it and, you know, do all these other things to it. It's, it's really just, it's a phenomenal tool. So the kinds of things I've made, let's see if I can go to my library. Um, so so I, I run something called the Global Education Fair. I made badges for it and the right sizes for social media which really helps um, I do social media for another group that has a camp so I made some camp things here um, but you know I'm always I'm always I'm always using this and using the things that they have here and then changing it up for myself and some of these are, are Twitter sizes some of these sizes are for Facebook some of them are, are generic or Instagram sized um, 
but you know, I'm not an artist and like this makes things look relatively good. Um, yeah, it would be nice to know about this at the beginning of the year, right Ruby? So I use this all the time and make sure you Google Canva for education so you can see what the education features are. And, and they may have education pricing and some stuff too, I'm not sure. But I use that probably the most more than anything. So these are some places that you can find other images. Um, and then for video, yeah, okay, so then we did that, okay. So for editing, I'm not gonna go into these majorly because we don't have a ton of time, but there's a lot of free online tools for doing very basic editing. So PicMonkey, I like PicMonkey and I like, um, I haven't done this for a while, and you may have to pay for this, I can't remember. It, it looks like there's a free trial. And I might pay for PicMonkey. It's been a while since I've done any editing. I pay for a lot of apps, unfortunately. So um, you can edit, you can touch up, you can design, you can do a collage. And you can pull photos from Facebook, from your computer. And it looks like it, OneDrive is a, is a Microsoft thing. So if you have stuff in, micro, in, in there, you can. I can connect it to my Flickr account and grab my pictures from Flickr. So let's see, if I go to Facebook, I connect it to my account. Give it access, I thought I did. Continue as Lucy. I did, I did give you that, there, okay. So here are my photos. And I don't really wanna do it with watercolor photos. Um, so I could take, you know, a couple of these. Let's see what happens if I take one. Well, I guess I just click on one and open it. It's not doing anything. Come on. All right, it's not cooperating with me. But these are, these are um, maybe it's because Flash is blocked. Anyway, we'll figure it out later. But these are some tools that if you're looking to do Photoshop-like things, they'll help with that. The other thing that's been really um, popular with teachers is our tools that let you make infographics. And, I, and, and Canva is one of them. And an infographic will be, you know, something that kind of gives, um, let's see, uh, you know, some basic information about things with data in it. So these are examples of infographics. And I'm terrible at making these kinds of things um, and making them look good. But I think this is like one kind of, um, one kind of piece of multimedia that students could actually do to summarize a unit or a history unit or um, research that they've conducted on something. Uh, so, you know, PictoChart, I believe, is also an app on your for devices as well. So, you know, take a look at these if you're interested in pursuing them. Some of them are free, some of them are not. Um, but they, that might be another option to play around with this summer. I highly recommend just taking the stuff, taking your pictures, and playing with it. Then the last part of this, what I, I can't believe how fast this went, was I wanted to talk about how you find videos. And, and Vimeo and YouTube have Creative Commons licensed videos that you could take and put into another video. And next week we're, we're gonna do a deep dive into YouTube, so I'm not gonna spend a lot of time on this. Um, but these on the left-hand side are places where you can find videos that you might wanna use in your classroom somehow. In the middle column are different ways you can make videos. And, um, you know, Animoto is very popular. Powtoon is very popular in schools for making kind of cartoon-like videos. Um, but there's usually something that's built into your device, whatever you're using. If you're on a Chromebook um, or you want to use something that's a web-based tool, WeVideo is very popular right now for creating videos. It's completely online. And there is an education version of it uh, for schools. Um, they do contests for students and things like that. So you may want to take a look at this. And, and I don't know what the pricing is. I'm sure you can probably do a couple of videos for free. Um, but there, you know, this is, there's, you know, on, the, on Macs, the popular tool has been iMovie. It's great. 
and there's not been nothing really on the web and we video is probably the first to really do uh, web you know video editing on the web so that would be the one that would be kind of normal I mean or, or kind of cross-platform QuickTime is Apple's is built into Macs and you can record screens and do screen casting with it and record yourself and do a whole bunch of different things with it it's built in it's it's and people again don't take advantage of it so take a look at that then the last column are um, websites that will or apps that will let you do screencasts so if you're interested in flipping your classroom and and you know doing kind of a short lecture for students via video that they watch before they do an assignment or something and you want to create your own stuff um, these are some options for you some are free some are not I like screencast o -Matic, and I believe I paid for a version that let me record longer videos um, but you know you can do a fair amount with a free piece of it and you don't want to make videos very long in general because nobody will watch them if you do um, but you just you just record and it and do whatever on your screen and it makes a little movie for you so um, you know take a look at these and think about how you might want to use them in the classroom and and just play around with them so that's it in a nutshell I just wanted to kind of cover some of these tools for you and and have you start thinking about how you're managing multimedia and how you're creating stuff on your own and you don't have to reinvent the wheel there's stuff out there that you can repurpose through Creative Commons licenses um, but that's really kind of what I wanted to get at this is going to piggyback on you know we talked about presentations last week so the stuff that you create here you can use in those presentations and then next week we're going to talk about YouTube and YouTube is I love YouTube not because I'm a great creator I, I'm not all these young people are doing things that are really sophisticated and um, you know amazing to me um, one of my favorite ones for instance is um, oh it's the vlog brothers but they do crash course um, there's a lot of good content on these different channels for schools so we're going to talk about how do you find this good content what are some good channels for finding it how do you organize videos you know maybe you're not a content creator but you can make playlists of other people's content that you can repurpose for lessons so we'll talk a little bit about that um, and we also will talk about how could you create video yourself or put video up yourself in YouTube um, so this will kind of piggyback on on today's webinar um, and hopefully it will give you a fuller picture of the possibilities um, for this so um, I think I'm done everything that you need to look at um, is in here um, in the slides so if you have any questions you can go into Google Classroom and ask me you can ask me now you can ask me later in Google Classroom but I would recommend you know now that it's, it's summer break for many of us um, you know just just play around and find a couple tools that work really well for you and invest some time in it you don't have to know all of these um, but find what seems to make sense for you for your budget you know free hopefully um, for your you know the ease of use and 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 then you know, add that to your arsenal for for how you approach things um, when the school year starts or when you do your student teaching or, or whatever before we go does anybody have any questions for me Oh, here's I'm gonna look at the chat here um, great yeah I know this is overwhelming Christina I know can you repeat all that ha 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 yeah I know this is a lot and I thought I I'll, I, I'll try and simplify it next week but um, the whole point is that you guys can go back and kind of reprocess this great okay all right guys you're awesome thank you so much for coming I really appreciate it the homework I had was if you want to find an image and do something with it or a piece of video uh, and post it to our Google Classroom, you could uh, post it anywhere in there or I'll make an assignment category for it. Um,
but you don't feel like you're obligated to. I, it's just suggested that you do some homework just so that you get some practice in. I'm not going to like grade you or, you know, make, 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 you don't have to do the uh, last week's homework to come to next week's um, webinar. Uh, thanks for sticking with me a little bit longer than usual. And um, I appreciate it. And uh, be ready for YouTube next week. And I think you'll really enjoy it. Okay, everyone. Good night, everyone. Um, have a good evening and weekend, and I'll see you next Wednesday. Thanks for coming.